God is the Divine Author Inspired by Muji Written and published by Audible Aria Muji, born Anthony Paul Mu Young, is a Jamaican spiritual teacher and proponent of non-duality, Advaita Vedanta. Muji's teachings focus on the realization of the self as pure consciousness, beyond the ego and individual identity. He emphasizes the importance of living in the present moment, letting go of attachments, and recognizing one's true essence as unchanging awareness. His discourses and teachings are available through various online platforms, including YouTube, where he reaches a global audience. Now, I feel like I want to invite you fully, completely into my being. You are already my being, but I want to invite you into every part of my life. Sometimes in certain activities or areas of my life, I feel like I'm alone and have to handle things by myself. But I know that's not true. I really want to invite you fully. When you talk like that, you're seeing yourself as a separate person. And that idea of being a person always needs help because it's created by the mind and the conditioning we've experienced. For most people, when they say I, they think it's referring to this personal self. But no one really encourages us to look deeper than that. So most people see themselves as just a person. But that's really just a concept formed in the mind. In truth, we are not just a person. We are pure universal consciousness. When this understanding becomes clear, especially when I meet people like you who come to Satsang, Satsang is a philanthropic organization founded by Sri Sri Thakur Anukul Chandra. Established in the early 20th century, it has become one of India's major spiritual and cultural movements. Satsang focuses on promoting spiritual growth and community welfare. I don't see you as just an individual. It's like universal consciousness is acting as an individual and bringing us together. And I believe this happens so we can wake up to our true nature, where we're no longer covered by false ideas of who we are. You are moving out of this limited view and into your natural state. I already have that confidence because people don't come like this without reason. Most people in the world don't have a deep awareness of themselves. I don't push them away. I meet them where they are. But I trust that every encounter, even with animals, is guided by universal consciousness. We don't need to overthink it. Just having faith in that is enough. It creates the space for grace to flow everywhere. That's how it happens. Satsang is very special. Many people around the world are searching for spiritual reasons, whether it's in Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, or any other path, millions are on a spiritual journey. But most are searching with a strong sense of themselves as separate individuals. In our personal search, we often see God as the highest person because we have a strong sense of ourselves as a person. So we think of God as a supreme being and God, as the supreme consciousness, may appear as a supreme being to match our ideas and expectations, showing us love in a way we can understand. But when we search for the ultimate truth, we realize that most of us are still attached to categories like gender, race, religion or culture. We think these things define us. A sage, however, is beyond all these things, on the surface, they may appear as a Muslim, Hindu, Christian, or even an atheist, but deep down they have realized wholeness and universal consciousness. Now, someone who is spiritually awakened is aware of their sense of being a person. They may have a family or a job and live their lives like anyone else. So what's different about them? The difference is that they don't feel they need to get rid of these roles. They don't have an issue with having a job or a family. The real issue is with identity. If they lived only from the point of view of a personal identity, their inner world would be much more complicated. But they have figured out the mystery of being a person and realized that, in truth, the idea of being a person is very shallow. They have come to see and understand the unchanging consciousness. And I feel blessed to see that everyone is that. There is no one who isn't this consciousness. Everyone is part of the universal consciousness. But it's important to realize this, not just in the mind or as a concept, but to actually shift into that consciousness. So it's okay to say, I am personal and I am impersonal. Even a realized being 
may still relate to their family. They don't act like their family doesn't exist. People who say, oh, nothing exists, in a dismissive way, are still not fully awake to the truth. A sage would say, yes, it exists, but it's a temporary and illusory existence. Even the sense of myself as a person is an illusory existence. What knows this is my true self? And when I talk about my true self, I don't mean something far away. It's right here. And this is true for everyone. It's not something unique to one person. Perhaps the only uniqueness is that some have gone beyond the illusion, the mirage of being a person. Waking up from that illusion is the most beautiful thing. I wouldn't even call it an experience because all experiences come and go. So I don't know what else to call it but the truth. What you're talking about is very relatable. It's the same question all the sages have asked. They had to start there too. They would say, I feel like I see the limitations of being a personal self and something within me is struggling to break free from this. And depending on the person, everyone is moving according to their own path. No matter what your path or destiny is, you are still under the presence of God. Whatever path you seem to be on is the way through which God guides you back to your true self, free from the false identities we create in our minds. So, your question or request, when it comes genuinely from the heart, how can it be genuine? It's also by God's grace that it becomes genuine. You can see your soul as being on a journey of shedding its false, dreamlike self. That is what satsang, spiritual gathering, is for. That is what spiritual practice, sadhana, is for. To wake up from the limitations of personhood, it has to be happening within you. The paradox is that when you come into this living opportunity, all kinds of negativity may arise. What a teacher can do is to tell you, don't believe these negative thoughts are judgments against you. They are a form of release. We forget how much toxic energy and information come with being a person. And our personal life story in this body might be 30, 40 or 50 years long, but the journey of your soul extends far beyond the time frame of your body. For a long time we've been living with different identities. Each lifetime is, in a way, a chance to process and transcend certain deep-rooted habits or tendencies, vasanas. Vasanas are like hidden tendencies, habits that need to be purified. As you cleanse these tendencies, new ones may surface. They aren't necessarily new, but are coming up from deep within. And we keep cleaning, keep cleansing. Each time the consciousness becomes purer, lighter, more clear. But even after transcending many things, you can still remain within the concept of being a person. You just become a more blessed person. Now, we can't completely trust that we understand what we see because many things are happening in our lives that we aren't aware of. Sometimes we think we have a deep understanding of something, but when real understanding comes, we realize, wow, there were so many things hidden from us. That's why it's the grace of God that helps us see more clearly when we pray and seek guidance. I've been sharing two key points about this. The first point is that, for most of us, we see ourselves as an entity, like, I am this person, this is my body. And we hold on tightly to our conditioning, our identities, our dreams and projections. All of this gives us the sense that we are solid and fixed in our beliefs, our shape and our identity. But in truth, we are suffering because we don't have a clear awareness of who we truly are. We may have some awareness, but it is clouded by conditioning, old habits, arrogance and ignorance. Our view of ourselves is not clear, and that's why the grace of God is so important. But God's grace often comes with humility. It comes through trying, failing and realising that relying on our ego alone is not enough. I used to say, many years ago, that this whole human concept, the way we see the world and ourselves, doesn't really work on its own. It only starts to make sense when it wakes up and connects with the Supreme Consciousness. Otherwise, it's like we're just rolling downhill. When we connect consciously with the Supreme, then we truly wake up. Now, I want to share something that might sound a bit unusual. The idea of a human being is not the ultimate reality. The only true reality is pure consciousness, which is what we truly are, but we're unaware of it. 
human being cannot overcome the limitations of being human on its own. We may try to overcome these limitations by force, or by being tough, but that's not really overcoming anything. It just makes us more stuck in our human identity. There's nothing we can do that will surprise God. There is no such thing as an original thought that God didn't know about. God is not sitting there saying, Oh, wow, I didn't know they would do that. That's just a human way of thinking about things. Everything that happens in life, in this book of existence, has only one author, and that is the Supreme. But people often think of the Supreme as an entity, like a great God. And it can appear like this to us, as a great God. Different religions and doctrines have different ideas about God. Even within one religion, people can have varied ideas about God depending on how their own beingness functions and sees the world. So, no one can fully know God in a limited way like that. Your heart, your devotion, your love and your deep longing for truth are what make you more pure. They draw you closer to an understanding of God. It is not about knowing God in a mental or intellectual way. It is about becoming more aligned with God through your sincerity and inner growth. I'm saying this because I want you to open your mind enough to understand that everything in the universe is interconnected and comes from the same source. Let me give you an example. Think of a writer who has written a great book. This book is filled with many different characters. Some are mean, nasty and vicious, while others are kind, loving and friendly. Some characters are boring, while others are exciting. They are also different and diverse in their actions and personalities. But even though all these characters seem very different from one another, every single one of them was created by the same pen, by the same author. They all came from the same mind and were written by the same hand. No character in the book can say, Hey everyone, we don't like how this story is going. Let's keep it a secret from the author and refuse to appear in the next chapter to protest. We want things to change. If such a protest happens in the story, it would still be the author who wrote it that way. This example is to help you understand that nothing in existence is hidden from God. God is the author of everything, writing the book of creation. Every level of the manifest world, whether it's the physical realm we see or the non-physical realm we sense, is written by God. Everything we see and experience is a manifestation of his creation. If you truly understand this, it can protect you from the effects of confusion and delusion. You will realize that God knows everything and nothing is outside of his awareness. When you understand this deeply, you'll know that you can never really be lost. And when you realize you can never really be lost, then your salvation, your freedom, is very close. But knowing this on an intellectual level is not enough. You can't just know something in your mind and expect it to feel real. It has to be a lived experience. What you think you know is not enough. The highest knowledge is to see that nothing in your world exists independently of your consciousness. You are the one witnessing everything that happens. Even when you think something is happening over there to other people, it is still appearing within your consciousness. If you realize that everything you perceive through your mind and senses is just a phenomenon, meaning they have no independent or permanent existence and are just appearances or effects within consciousness, then you will see that the witness of all these things is separate from them. That witness is your true self. This understanding is not just an idea. It must become clear and obvious to you. When it does, you won't feel trapped or bound by the events and experiences of the world anymore. For some time, as you go through life on a personal level, you might still find yourself asking, why did this happen? Or, why am I going through this? These kinds of thoughts may continue to arise, but at some point, you will begin to see that everything that comes up in you is actually being witnessed by something within you. When you come to understand that this witness is not a person, you will realize that even your personal self is being witnessed by this deeper awareness. Now, what is it that is witnessing you? It's not something you can easily describe. 
Some people might call it consciousness or awareness, but it is more than just a concept. You start to realise it must be me. But it's not the me that is the personal self. It's not the me that is caught up in personal stories, fears and desires. The most important thing here is this I that you identify with. You have to take this I beyond the limits of the personal self and into the space of the neutral, uninvolved witness. When you see this, you will also see that this witness is not a separate being or entity. It is pure consciousness. This realization doesn't happen all at once. It unfolds gradually. My role is to help make this process clearer for you. If you genuinely ask from your heart, like you did, please help me go beyond the grip of my psychological identity. It's because your consciousness has already begun to open up to that realization within you. And when I hear that kind of request from someone, I feel it deeply in my heart. I affirm, so be it. And from that moment, the process continues. It unfolds bit by bit, becoming clearer as it goes. You start to see more clearly, and you offer up what is holding you back. As you do this, it all becomes more transparent. Recently, in satsang, we've been talking about making a conscious prayer before we go deep into our contemplation exercises, like the Just Be exercise. I've been suggesting that we ask God, please scan my being. And if you are asking this, it's already by God's grace that you are prepared to realise and make this request. You ask, please scan my being and dissolve or remove any negative energies within me that are still active and causing suffering, confusion, anxiety, depression, or anything else that troubles me. I offer these things up to be transformed or deleted. That is a conscious, heartfelt prayer. When you do this with sincerity, by God's grace, you will begin to notice things in yourself that you couldn't see before. Then, when you recognize these things, you can consciously say, I offer this up. Over time, the grip of those negative patterns, those fingerprints in your mind, begins to fade away. This process keeps going, and as it does, something within you becomes more purified, clearer and freer. Then, when you move into the Just Be exercise, the strength of it is that it is beyond concepts. Many of the things we think about ourselves, like, I'm so impatient, I wish I could be more kind, or I wish I could give more, are all personal desires. And while they may seem important, they are also part of the illusion of the personal self. These thoughts and wishes arise because you are still identifying as a person. As you continue to practice and go deeper, you will see that these personal requests and desires are not your true self. They are part of the conditioning that comes with being in the state of personhood. The real I is beyond these personal concerns and exists in a state of pure awareness. Recognizing this is the beginning of real freedom and the dissolution of the false personal identity. It can be very hard for people to accept the idea that I am illusory, that the self they think they are isn't truly real. They might think, how can I be an illusion? I'm here. I can see, I can feel, I exist. This understanding doesn't come all at once. It's a gradual process, like a slow cleaning or clearing of the mind. Little by little, you start to see, oh, I can actually understand this now. For instance, if this sense of I is somehow polluted by thoughts, feelings or beliefs, there is still an awareness of that pollution. And this awareness, this I, must be beyond all that. You see? It happens step by step. All this inner work is happening by grace. Whether you call it the grace of God or the grace of your true self, it's really the same thing. In the exercises we do, I often suggest starting with a simple idea. Just let go of everything. I don't mean you should destroy anything or fight against it. I just mean to let go. Stop being attached to all these things. You'll be surprised at how simple this can be. You don't need to think deeply about each thing like, oh, this thought, that feeling. No, just let go of everything. Everything that comes into your mind is an illusion, including the ideas you have about yourself. 
So don't hold on to anything at all. It's like if someone told you, go sit over there and just be quiet. Don't get involved with anyone or anything. And you feel relieved and say, thank you. So you go and sit quietly. You start letting go of all your connections, all the things that keep popping up in your mind. You might not be able to stop these thoughts from coming, but when they do, you just decide, okay, I won't engage with this thought or feeling. You might need to try this a few times, but slowly, little by little, you start moving away from being caught up in these illusions. You start coming out of the fog of delusion and into clarity. So the practice is to let go of everything. Yes, let go of everything. Even your favorite ideas about yourself or the ones you don't like so much. Just keep letting go, letting go, letting go. Imagine there's a sort of psychic hole at the top of your head and all the stuff you've learned, all the ideas and beliefs you've held on to, just start to flow out. Everything you've ever learned, understood or misunderstood, every single idea or identity you've held on to, it all just starts to flow out little by little like a long, slow exhale. Take a deep breath and exhale slowly. Everything is just drained away and in that emptiness, you start to discover what's real and what's true beyond all the noise of the mind. Even after letting go of everything, you will still find something that cannot be removed. This something is not personal. It is completely empty in a pure and intentional way. What is that? It is the pure unmixed consciousness. This is the root of all experiences. Consciousness is what rises up as the sense of I am. The feeling of I am is the natural, intuitive way consciousness identifies itself. Imagine if a powerful being came to you and said, I favour you. Ask for anything in the whole world and I can give it to you right now. Then you ask, what will it cost me? And the being replies, you can have everything you want, but you have to give up your consciousness in exchange you'd immediately see how meaningless that offer is. Why? Because without consciousness, you wouldn't even know you exist. You wouldn't be aware of yourself or anything else. Everything is experienced through consciousness. I say this because consciousness is the foundation of everything. Whether you gain everything or lose everything, it makes no difference to consciousness itself. Consciousness remains pure and untouched. When you say, I am... What you're really pointing to is that sense of pure being. It's an intuition that isn't tied to any idea, belief or identity. It's beyond concepts like parents, friends, religion, last year, next year, heaven, hell or being Muslim, Hindu, Christian or anything else. It is beyond all these things. This is the pure, untainted presence of God. That is what remains. Everything else, our ideas, our identities, our cultures, are what we pick up from the world around us. This includes the basic belief, I am this body, I am my culture, these are my parents, these are my friends, this is my education, these are my dreams, and so on. When we hold on tightly to these beliefs, we are stuck in ignorance, thinking that these things define who we are. The lessons I am sharing with you is not something that is easily accepted in the world. Why? Because most people, even though deep down they are pure consciousness, are caught up in their identities and beliefs. But one day, you will come to see a deeper truth. Only God exists. There are no separate, independent beings. It is all one. Everything is God. So what does this mean? Does it mean that all these different forms and things will just disappear? No, it doesn't mean that. What will disappear is the belief that these forms are truly separate from each other. When your inner eyes are fully open, you will see this. Until that happens, we live in a world of actions, reactions and interactions. These things keep happening all the time, but there is something that exists outside of all this activity. Something that is beyond it all. It watches everything, but with a sense of detachment. You might wonder, why watch the richness and diversity of life with detachment? What's the point? The answer is that this detachment is the root of all things. It is the source from which all energy and life come. All the richness of life flows from this source, and yet the source itself loses nothing. Think of it this way. 
If I asked you to recall everything that happened yesterday, you might feel overwhelmed. You might think, oh no, where do I even start? Yesterday was so chaotic. At ten I was thinking one way, but by eleven my thoughts were completely different. I can't remember it all. This is because nothing in life is stable or constant, except for one thing, consciousness. And this consciousness is pure. It doesn't come with a story or drama attached to it. In our world, we are used to having stories, adventures and constant change. We chase different experiences to satisfy our desires, projections and so on. Because of this, we often don't appreciate pure consciousness. When I say pure consciousness, I don't mean a state where there are no thoughts at all. No, thoughts may come and go, but they do not affect the purity of consciousness itself. What this means is that you have gone beyond the need to be this way or that way. You've transcended those needs and desires. Your true being is returning to its original nature, the divine nature of God. In this state you cannot be fooled or trapped by illusions. It's as if everything is completed. This realization isn't about a personal success story or achievement. In fact, you begin to see that the personal life, as we usually think of it, is filled with all sorts of delusions and misunderstandings. Realizing the self is not about collecting a lot of knowledge and becoming a human encyclopedia. It's actually about becoming totally empty. All the knowledge of the world and human beings is of no use to the divine. In this divine state, only love and joy remain. When I say there, I really mean here. But we use the word there, and there is really no there. You just need to drop the T. Everything is here. When we talk about there, we're really just talking about the mind. Now if someone asks, can I just die in this love? Yes, you can. But the only thing that really needs to die in this love is something that isn't real to begin with. This love and the truth are the same. They are one. Love and your true being are also the same. But remember, it's not the kind of love that's all about feelings or something romantic. It's not about personal attachment. We tend to make a big deal out of personal love, to exaggerate it. And that's fine too. It's all part of love in some way. At every level of life, there is love. But the purest form of love is the same as pure being, your true self. We don't have to work so hard to be something special or to become something. It's only because the mind doesn't understand its true nature that it tries so hard to be something it can never really be. The truth is, you are already that pure being. Somehow you just have to come to see this for yourself. At some point, this realization will come. By grace, you will see that you can never really stop being your true self. Everything else is just like a dream. What I'm sharing with you is not just a bunch of ideas or information to remember. Nowadays, when we speak, I'm not giving you knowledge in the usual way, like in the form of concepts or theories. Instead, it comes as grace. And through grace, you experience becoming empty. The human mind often wants to be full, full of knowledge, full of ideas, full of things to do. But this fullness is often just complexity and confusion. When grace comes, it doesn't add more to you. It takes away all the complications of the world. It clears away the confusion and leaves you in your original, pure state. In that state, you don't know why you feel so happy or at peace. You don't feel like you've achieved anything in particular. If someone asks you, what have you gained? You might say, I haven't gained anything at all. If they ask, what have you lost? You could answer, I haven't lost anything either. Or if they ask, where are you coming from? You might reply, I don't really know, maybe from everywhere. But you don't even have to say these things. It's just that in this state, you don't feel the need to hold on to any specific knowledge or identity. Don't think that real knowledge is about having a big collection of spiritual or religious information stored up like an encyclopedia. Real wisdom appears naturally in the moment when it's needed. It's not something you save up for later use. Saved up knowledge is always too late to be truly useful. In fact, the wise ones, the sages, know nothing in the conventional sense. They see that knowing something is actually a kind of limitation. They simply are. Just like you simply are. 
They're not focused on becoming something or even on being something. They just exist. But this simple, natural state is not appealing to the ego-driven mind. The ego wants a journey. It wants to feel like it's achieving something. But this journey is also part of God's plan, written in God's book. Many people think of themselves as individual souls, but actually individual souls don't really exist separately. It's all part of God's dream or story. In truth, there is only God. And God is not a person or a thing. God is the totality of everything that exists and can ever exist. And your true essence is that same God. But God isn't a he, she, or it. God is beyond all human ideas and descriptions. Your true purity cannot be defined and it cannot be corrupted either. It's only because of illusions that we seem to be this or that and experience emotions like sadness, anxiety, joy or confusion. It's all part of the game of life. But if you understand why life plays out this way and see that everything that happens is meant to help you grow in wisdom and simplicity, then these things won't bother you so deeply. You won't find yourself fighting against them. Now, if you're just being lazy, that's also part of the illusion of who you think you are. Grace, or the divine help, gives you the energy to keep searching for the truth. Everything is already written in the book of life, and everyone is discovering truth at their own pace, based on how mature they are spiritually. We need to understand that everyone has their own path of growth, and it doesn't happen in a straight line. Someone might look like they're stuck, and you might think you're doing better, but suddenly they might progress faster than you. It doesn't work like, oh, he's moving at five miles an hour, in two weeks he'll be here. You can't measure it like that. There comes a time when waking up spiritually means waking up from the dream of illusions. Part of that illusion makes life seem meaningful at a certain level. As you grow, you go beyond that meaning and it just dissolves. Then maybe another layer of illusion appears. But eventually you might think, I'm not interested in these layers anymore, I kind of understand now. That doesn't mean you've figured everything out. But at some point your soul and heart feel content. The strong desire to search for the truth starts to fade away. But don't say, I've figured it all out, I'm done now. No, don't jump to any conclusions. Just stay open and present in the moment. It feels really good that way. You don't have to overthink or analyse everything. Just keep your focus on simply being on your true self. By doing this, you're starving the mind of the energy it needs to create illusions and distractions. Yes, at first, this might feel like you're forcing yourself, and that's okay. It takes effort to undo the habits and false beliefs that have built up over years. So keep your attention on just being and hold it there. What you're really doing is training your mind to rest in the heart. We haven't done this before, so the mind acts like a spoiled child who's used to getting its way. When you tell it to sit still, it just laughs at you, saying, Make me sit down. It's so arrogant that it thinks it can do whatever it wants. You might try to be firm and say, Hey, sit down. But the mind just laughs back at you because it knows you don't have the power to control it. That's because when you try to control the mind as a person, it's still the mind trying to control itself, and it doesn't work. You don't have the real power this way. But when you hold on to the sense of just being, you start to see how strong and arrogant the mind can be, how restless it is, and how deeply ingrained its habits are. As a person, you realise you have no power over it, it's like the child is in charge instead of the parent. But here's the thing. The parent in this scenario isn't the true parent. It's been the ego all along, trying to manage its own confusion. When you focus on just being, you're actually tapping into the grace of God that has been preparing you for this. It's this grace that gives you the ability to keep your attention on being, even when your reflex is to go back to the noise of the mind. So, I say, keep at it, don't give up. Over time, you'll notice a change. At first, you might want to break up your practice into smaller sessions, maybe five or seven minutes at a time, then gradually increase it to ten minutes, then another ten. This way, you can start to feel the difference, and you'll notice that the intensity of the mind's noise starts to lift. And why is this happening? 
it's because you're keeping your attention on just being. At some point, the mind might rebel against this, but that rebellion won't last. Slowly, the mind will come under the influence of grace and will become anchored in the heart. The truth is, the mind actually wants to return to the heart, but it's out of control with its own bad habits, so it needs a higher authority, this grace, to guide it back. And that authority, the power to guide you, comes from the grace of God. It's this grace that tells the seeker of truth, sit down and do this practice. It's not about sitting down and saying, well, I tried it, but... No, beingness doesn't have a story like that. It doesn't follow a timeline. Beingness doesn't dwell on yesterday or last year. It's so pure that no concept or story can truly live in it. But in the beginning, you'll see that the immature being, the immature soul, is afraid of beingness because it's like an addict. It's addicted to having an identity and creating all sorts of things. So when it doesn't get to do that, it gets really angry. But that's okay. Just hold steady and don't get caught up in the story. Over time, you'll start to see everyone in the world is searching for the same thing, even if they don't realize it. People living in the mode of personhood or ego are restless souls. That's why we're always chasing after the next thing, and the next thing, never satisfied. The ego wants one experience after another, constantly moving on to the next. This creates agitation because it can never be truly content. Why? Because God made it this way, and actually it's a blessing in disguise. If you could be content with things that are illusions or just delusions, you would be truly lost. So when your life stops working the way you want it to, it's actually a sign of grace. It's like you reach a point where you realize you don't have time to keep creating false projections. You become desperate, and this desperation brings you to the edge, to the door of nirvana. So remember, no one is forgotten by God. Everyone is included in his plan. You might feel like you're dying inside, and then suddenly you're uplifted. You might feel on top of the world, and then you're brought down. These ups and downs, this mix of arrogance and humility, are powerful forces, but they're all part of God's grand plan. He's written the greatest story, a living story. Think about it. If you went to watch a movie where everyone is happy all the time, you'd probably walk out within ten minutes, right? The human mind craves contrast. It wants adventure, excitement, a car chase... A sad moment followed by a happy one. Life and death. Birth and rebirth. The mind loves the drama, the diversity of life's experiences. It's addicted to action and concepts. That's why we have so many dreams and plans. Constantly chasing after one thing and then another. You can't even hold on to one dream for long before you're dreaming up something new. The soul is restless. Constantly searching. But what it's really searching for is rest and peace. That's why, when someone finally finds peace, they recognize it immediately. They might even realize, all my life, I never knew peace. But when it finally comes, you know it instantly. And it feels like the most natural thing for you. Until you're ready to receive it, though, you might keep imagining that peace will come through having a good job, becoming famous, starting a family, getting married, buying a holiday home, becoming rich, or whatever else you think will make you happy. Maybe you even think it'll come from doing something extreme, like jumping off a mountain without a parachute. The soul keeps searching for something, but it's really looking for that true peace. But the thing that the mind keeps grabbing onto and seeing is not the truth. This is why I tell you about the ancient meditators and sadhus from long ago. They had a practice where they would say, Neti, Neti which means not this, not that. Whatever the mind showed them, they would say, no, it's not that, it's not this. Even when the mind would ask, what about this? They would still say, neti, neti, not that. They could never say exactly what the truth is, but they could point out what it isn't. Why? Because what the truth is, is actually what they themselves are. We often have a desire for the things of the world, and this desire can last for a while, but we don't really know how long that while will be. 
We can't estimate the time it will take because we don't truly understand time in this way. Now the only true inner guide is knowing when something isn't from the Spirit and when it is. I feel this is how you're blessing us, by helping us to fully transform. Because when you're not connected to the Spirit, all kinds of things will catch your attention and fascinate your mind. But these things don't really have any lasting value. They're just bits of information, sensations, fleeting and temporary. The so-called facts of being human are mostly fictional based on subjective interpretations and projections. They can be very deceitful and manipulative too, and we shouldn't be surprised by that. Now, whether you should say neti neti, or accept what's happening, depends on how you're feeling and what you need in that moment. There are times when it's important to say, whatever this is, it's not the ultimate truth. Why do we say neti neti? Because it means that whatever you're experiencing is just something happening inside you. It's something that can be noticed by an observer that is separate from it. This means that whatever you're seeing or feeling isn't the original unchanging truth. It's just something that has come up, something that appears for a while. If you're interested in it, it might stick around longer. But no matter how important or subtle it seems, it's still just a visitor. And so you can say, but I'm here to see it. Whatever it is that says I is the formless observer, the one who sees everything happening. It's like when something appears in the sky, whether it's a rainbow or a star, it comes and goes. But the vast space of the sky remains untouched. That space is like your true self. You're looking from that place. But sometimes we're looking at the world through a mix of ideas we have about ourselves. We see the world through the lens of our personal thoughts and feelings. Even then, you can step back and notice, oh, my world, my problems, my hopes, my pain, they are all seen by something. And the one who is experiencing all these things, the one who feels the pain, that person is also being observed. What is it that is noticing all of this? I say, don't just think about this, really look. Can the observer be observed? If you can see the observer, then there must be an even subtler observer behind it. And when you keep looking in this way, all the noise and confusion in your mind just starts to dissolve. What's left after that? If anything remains, it too will be noticed. But can the thing that notices everything, the thing that says, all this is just an illusion, can it be seen? Where does this deep looking take you? Everything just dissolves into nothingness. And even nothingness is noticed. But what is it that sees even the nothingness? Don't make things up. Be very clear and honest with yourself. What is it that sees all of this? You can't really say what it is, but the fact is, whatever it is, it can be observed. The observer itself cannot be seen. Can the observer become something that can be perceived like an object? If there's an object of perception, then what is the subject? If you say, well, there's no separate subject, then who is saying this? When you keep questioning like this, all the ideas your mind creates just start to disappear. What's left after that? Frustration? No, what's left is an indescribable peace and joy. That thing that notices everything, what proof is there of its existence? Can you take a picture of it? Can you show it to someone? No, you can't. So don't make it a habit to talk about this with just anyone. Don't go around discussing it with every person you meet. Instead, keep looking within. Keep questioning until even the idea you have of yourself as the one who is looking falls away. And then you might wonder, what happens after that? I say, I'm not going to tell you. You have to find out for yourself. That's where grace comes in. It's the grace of God that gives you the desire to look within and helps guide you in your search. If you go to your mind, it might try to create something out of it. But again, if you say neti neti, meaning not this, not that, you'll realize it's not what the mind is creating. Also, the mind will feel restless, like an itch, because it craves interaction with the world. But that too can be observed. Can you bear to sit with your own emptiness? The mind might feel uncomfortable, like it's getting anxious and biting its fingernails, but even this discomfort you can watch. 
Can you handle that? This is important. You might notice yourself twitching or feeling uneasy trying to quiet the mind, but I say no, don't suppress anything. Let the thoughts and feelings come and go. You are the one who watches all of this. It will require some subtlety and persistence, and you'll need the grace of God to help you. Without God's grace, everything would be lost. You have to stay with that awareness and be respectful of the presence of God within you. This kind of deep self-reflection is actually an act of devotion born out of love for God. There's a saying, he who is in search of himself finds God, and he who is in search of God finds himself. It's the same thing. But be careful, this isn't about finding yourself as a person. The personal self is the price you pay. Thank you for listening.